Oh, there you are. I thought you were back up there again. Yeah. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. You're practically a church. All right, everybody. Welcome to Padnug August. We kept the temperature down for one more day so that we can enjoy this and not kill anyone. Come tomorrow, though, we, we our lease runs out on cool weather. Relatively cool weather. Uh, this month, we have Donovan Brown. Wave at the audience, Donovan, from the back. <laughs> and Dave Harrison. Everyone remembers Dave Harrison? He was our, he was our guy. <laughs> Now he lives in beautiful Madras, Oregon, mm -hmm. that normally might be this warm. Mm -hmm. They're going to be over temperature in the next few days? Oh, yeah. It's going to be hot. He's right in so the eclipse path, too. Pet some goats and chickens, because that's what we've got lots of in Madras. You, know? <laughs> you personally have goats yet? Oh, yeah. You do? Three of them, and they're all jerks. Were they there when we were there? <laughs> <laughs> I know, because Ramona would not have left. <laughs> My girlfriend Ramona, her goal in life is to have goats. In our in our life, so okay, Madras, right? In Madras would be ideal too. So maybe we would be out there sooner than I realized. Yeah. <laughs> Plenty of goats, Tommy. Yeah, they're all jerks. We need to talk. They don't give a damn about anybody else. Okay, okay. Well, try to bring this back on track now, Donovan. It's not always like that. Okay, just so you know. <laughs> we have places to find Padnug. I don't know how someday we should find a way to consolidate all this, but they're all valid and useful things to go visit. As I pointed out before, if you go to padnug.org, I believe there's a uh, link to everything else. That's about all that's on padnug.org nowadays, but there you go. <laughs> In case you've missed it, I will leave this up for a few seconds so you can grab the uh, guest password. Thought you, Tracy, you already have one. <laughs> so bring your cameras out. Type quickly or just memorize. Three, two, one, go. All right, there's a whole lot of folks that helped make this all possible. The reason we exist is because Microsoft made something called .NET, and this was a .NET user group when it started. I feel weird about saying it's a .NET user group nowadays since on a good year we probably have three presentations that are .NET specific. But we are very Microsoft biased here, so just know that. Even when Amazon comes, they present how to do it for Microsoft tooling. Intel provides a great location for us. And although Darren's normally one to schedule, we'll thank Tracy because my proxy, you're, you're the Darren for the moment. Thank you. <laughs> and ShareWeb provides a place for us to host that padnug.org that needs to be updated. I know. It's been years, right? How many people know that I've been saying that for years? James does, you betcha. I remember how long you said it before you updated it. Uh-huh. <laughs> and it wasn't and it's really not even updated. It's just improved slightly. Oh, it was a big deal. Yeah, it? yeah, it's true. MVC? Yeah, it was MVC. It still is. <laughs> so outdated now, right? MVC what, two maybe? I don't know. Uh, I don't even know if our servers will hold new stuff. That's a that's something we gotta work out. Thirsty Lion provides gift cards for us each month. Yes, they are. There we got those. Uh, no new Amelia's, and I did remember them this month. I'm not going to have to rush out of here after introductions to go get the No Amelia gift cards. JetBrains, we have three of the JetBrains. Um, hey, <laughs> I didn't even know you were there yet. Yeah. Uh, JetBrains licenses to give out, and uh, I think that's all, right? Okay. We also have several people who make it possible for staff pizza every month and other gifts and such. Uh, let's start with a place called Vanderhaven. <laughs> oh, hey guys. <laughs> Your mouth still full, Andrew? Uh, there you want Tyler to do it? Uh, no, <laughs> he probably not. still remembers. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, hold on. Can I totally do that? <laughs> <laughs> do, not, do not talk for me. Hey, I, I'm Andrew. Uh, I'm with Vanderhaven. Uh, we've been uh, we've been recruiting and placing software developers in Portland for a really long time. I've been coming here for a long time as well. Um, I, I know a lot of you, I don't know all of you, so I would love to meet you if I haven't. Um, three, three, three key things that I wanted to bring up that I'm looking for that are kind of germane to tonight, a couple of them anyways. Um, so we work with a, with, with a couple hundred companies in Portland uh, actively, um, but uh, a couple of key things at least. So I am looking for, for a principal uh, cloud architect for Nike. No, it's fine. I thought we were talking about it. I literally thought that was Tyler 
Uh, we have a volunteer. <laughs> no, I, Tyler would do that. So no, I, I have a one-year contract at Nike for a principal cloud architect, and I can pay really, really well. Um, and uh, and I'll mention just one other thing. If, if you're a mid-level developer and you're open to something in Vancouver, I have uh, a full stack uh, position in the coup. Um, that, that pays around 80K, so junior to mid-level. Uh, and I, I'd love to chat about either of those things or any number of other things that I have going on. Very nice, Andrew. Will you be joining us afterwards? Uh, I will. Excellent. We'll get back to that. Uh, new Relic. Do we have a uh, New Relic? I believe I've seen someone. Really? Oh, there's a young man right there from New Relic. Hey everyone. I'm Matt from New Relic. <laughs> uh, so I'm part of our recruiting team in Portland. Uh, current openings that we have is we are looking for a software architect with Azure experience, uh, as well as a lead.net developer uh, for our downtown location. Um, if anybody's interested in going to San Francisco, I have a couple roles down there as well. So Ooh. I'll be at that after party as well. Excellent. Thank you, Matt. Um, SoftSource is a new sponsor, by the way. I happen to know a little bit about the place since I worked there. <laughs> uh, I, I, oddly enough, I can't relate to you the exact job descriptions that are available right now, but I know there's several. And part of that's because WebMD, where I'm actually on station, is ne in need of a lot of people. So uh, you can direct any questions toward me specifically, or um, if you met Charlie uh, two months ago, there was a t-shirt involved. Um, he he uh, is helping recruit for SoftSource. Adroit Resources also, I don't think we have representative here. Anyone? OK. Just checking. Let's see. Uh, tech Systems, I know you're here. <laughs> I'm here. Made it. Excellent. A little bit of traffic. Um, I'm Danielle. I work for Tech Systems. We are the leading IT staffing and services company and we work with over 100 clients here in Portland. Um, all kinds of positions. We're working on a few of the Home Depot positions as well as multiple .NET, ETL, VA, you name it, positions. So I'm going to buy everybody a drink if they come to Thirsty Lion. Yeah. I might show up. <laughs> you can hold me to that. And uh, I'd like to meet you all. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, Robert Half. Oh, <laughs> back row. I'm going all the way in the back. <laughs> I'm Steven, Robert Half. Uh, we are the world's oldest and largest staffing company, um, including IT and software development. Um, we have multiple open roles right now, some that might be some interest to you. We do need a senior doctor. I do need a, uh, a senior cloud engineer as well, uh, specifically the Microsoft stack, Azure, uh, but that would be at the Vancouver if anybody would mind making a drive. So, um, also, uh, a QA person, someone with a good background in C Sharp would be helpful. So, um, lots of roles open, lots of opportunities, a lot of good networking, and uh, we'll meet all of you uh, after the uh, event today. Well, thank you very much. Excellent. Uh, I, what? Dave? Do you want to recruit? <laughs> uh, it's right. Did everyone Ooh. notice that Commodore 64 shirt there? He 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 kind of expressed it just a little extra. There'll be the user group meeting next week. I just found out about it. That's right. Really That's right. <laughs> <laughs> IT motives. There you go. I caught you just at the last minute. It is. Um, <clears throat> I'm the only one here who likes motives tonight. I, two times in a row. I know. Great, Angelo had to go to the DevOps days. Yeah. Oddly enough. So I'm representing IT motives. We're not the largest. We're not the oldest. <laughs> and they've got Alina. <laughs> we have open positions, but I am more interested in talking to people, building relationships, networking, and having a good time. So let's do that. Excellent. Thank you. You didn't bring your uh, partner, though. Oh, yeah. Month. My son, he just started his software engineering camp. He came from the last Woo! Yeah. Woo! <laughs> I love it when we're, we're a bad influence on the kids. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we have someone from Home Depot tonight? Yeah, here. Ah, excellent. So uh, <laughs> I'm Nathan. I'm a lead engineer at Quote Center. Uh, we're a small division of Home Depot across the river, the big river in Vancouver. <laughs> uh, we're doing a lot of really cool stuff with uh, microservices, 
containers, distributed systems, Akka, venting, all sorts of great stuff. Uh, we're looking for a number of developers in various uh, levels of experience. Um, if you're interested, come see me. We'll be out after hours. Thanks. Excellent. See, Dave, how cool they are out there? Terrific. I, I, we were talking about you guys earlier. I, <laughs> and it was positive, too. Just so, just so you know, it was positive conversation. The rumors are true. So here's our upcoming stuff. Um, I felt really uncomfortable, like I was clicking the wrong stuff. So if something doesn't look quite right, let me know, and I'll, I won't fix it. But yeah, we'll try to adjust that on the fly. So in two days, down in Salem, Angelo's not here to promote it. And Bren's not here to promote it. Anyone from Salem who knows what's going on down there? OK, well, Lime Valley Software Engineers meet uh, first Thursday of every month, creating Alexa skills using .NET. Actually, I think they want to do that up here, too. Um, Docker Portland is uh, next, next week. Wow, that's soon. Next Monday. Squad, August 9th next week. Padnug has our west side geek dinner on the 15th. And you'll also notice, I'll skip a bit, but August 22, we have it on the east side, not just east of the mountains, the east side, but actual east side of Portland this time. We're heading on over to uh, Grand Central Bowling. Since uh, the downtown Thirsty Lion, I mentioned last year, last month, excuse me, they got a large sum of money to to uh, vacate that property. Turns out they're gonna be there an extra month and we could have gone back, but now we're gonna to go to Grand Central Bowling. The neat thing is, if enough of the geek dinner attendees are interested, they have gaming upstairs and they have bowling, a VIP bowling section downstairs. If there's people interested in that, we can make that happen. They will, Tuesdays aren't that busy there, so it's almost guaranteed we can get it. It's the group's personal two lanes. Oh, okay. Yes. Not your personal, personal. No, your personal. Okay, it might be mine. But anyway, <laughs> I get one of them. Y'all get the rest. No. Okay. <laughs> no. Anyway, so on August 16th, we have Portland Mobile, probably. The, I know sometimes summertime uh, people flex a little bit. We also have the Agile PDX meetup. Uh, Paula, you could probably address that specifically. So we're doing, um, this, I'm Paula, and we're doing Lean Coffee. So it's a great format for asking questions. So if you have questions about Agile, like say, for example, you're experiencing icky Agile, and you want to know how to solve it, or you have other I have questions. not heard that before, Paula. I want that term. <laughs> Can I borrow that term? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, if, if you have any questions about Agile, this would be a great um, opportunity to bring it, and, and people help you solve it. Can you get much sleep eat, having coffee that late, though? <laughs> or is it decaf? It's lean coffee. So. Okay. Oh, it's like decaf, but different. Got it. Uh, then uh, Portland sequel on August 24th. Final page, Portland TypeScript on the 29th. James, do you know anything about that, maybe? I do. Oh, good. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm the host. I know. I'm <laughs> Sorry. Um. Yeah, so we're still looking for a speaker. So my plug is this. If you've ever thought about standing up in front of a group of people and talking about technology, specifically web technology, would be great. We're a small, very friendly group. Let us know. We'd so love like to have you come talk about friendly here. Really anything. Friendly even, here. Even icky, agile. <laughs> Paula, you got to go. <laughs> Especially with that title in the, in the name. Uh, next. Pad Nug, September 5, Mark Schramm, Introduction to Microsoft Bot Framework. And although I didn't put it on here, uh, Jeremy Foster is going to do November, and he's going to do kind of a follow-on uh, mid-level bot framework presentation. I'm sure it's going to touch on some uh, uh, cognitive services and such, too. Then September 7th, I know this is pretty awesome, Hanselman's going to go to Salem. I think it would be nice to see several people from here go down to help support that. That'd be awesome. I know it's not the most convenient, but some of you traveled quite a ways to come out here. It probably wouldn't be much different to go to Salem. <laughs> uh, then October, we have Scott and two of his cohorts from uh, the team up there on ASP.NET Core going to present here at Padnuck. Right now, we're still probably meeting here, so it'll be more limited space. It won't be like the December super uh, presentation, but um, 
if enough people are interested, we could try to get the JFCC location too. So with nothing else on here, does anyone have any other announcements or questions or, hey, I'm looking for a job or, hey, I really desperately need people they want to mention? No? Okay. You want to have a baby, getting married? Okay. Fail well, still not out. Fail well, well, still not out. I'm still waiting for my license on that. <laughs> I've been flashing your stickers everywhere. Okay, anyway. Uh, afterwards, we go over to Thirsty Lion. Just thinking about it, apparently one or more people are willing to provide food or alcohol to you. How many people are going to come tonight, you think? That's, that's pretty good. And I, I think some of you are lying that aren't. So <laughs> I'm going to go all over and let them know. I think it's, we're going to bump the number up just a smidgen tonight. With no further ado, Donovan, sure. welcome to the Pet Portland metropolitan area. Thank you. Or did Dave want to come up first? How do you switch this over to my machine here? Magic. I think it's already happening. Hey, there's a it is Donovan magic. Brando. Oh, there is. Look at that. It's amazing. Amazing how that works. Technology. Can I start with a couple words? Oh, sure. Okay. Sure. Be my so guest. My job is to get off the stage as soon as possible. I just want to say thank you to you guys. It was a couple years ago that Rich invited me to come to talk about DevOps. I wasn't really sure what it was. And it's led to great things for me. It's been mind changing. You guys are a great audience. You're cool people. I enjoy coming here. Um, email me at dharriso at microsoft.com. That's D-H-A-R-R-I-S-O at Microsoft.com. We have an event coming up September 12th. I think Joe Dunn is putting it together. Uh, but it's going to be a whole day extravaganza on, on DevOps. And um, I work for Microsoft Premier. We do things like developer field assessments. We help build out your roadmap. So if you're looking for some expert advice on how to move forward with your DevOps uh, roadmap, uh, by all means, contact me. Um, so I wanted to introduce Donovan, though. He's, uh, with, uh, the, he's a principal DevOps um, manager with the Azure team. Uh, his website's awesome, donovanbrown.com. Uh, he just recently, about a year or so, moved to Houston, loves it there. Uh, but he travels all over, kind of encouraging people to move forward with their agile transformation efforts. And Donovan, Excellent. take it away. Thank you so much. So uh, good evening, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. But let's try that again. Good evening, everyone. Woo! There you go. Great. So as he said, my name is Donovan Brown, and I love, love, love working at Microsoft. My entire professional career, I've been working on Microsoft technology. Anyone old enough to remember compact computers? Anyone? Oh, a lot of old people. Okay, great. So for the young people, it's called HP now, but it's the same company. And that's where I started some 20 years ago writing software for Windows. So I've seen a lot of bad software. I've seen a lot of good software over my time. Before I joined Microsoft, I was a process consultant. It's a fancy way of saying I flew all over the world installing and implementing Team Foundation Server, back when it was TFS 2005, the bad one. right? And then I upgraded you to 2008, the hard one. right? And then 2010, the apology. right? It's like all these horrible sequels. They're like prequels, actually, if you think of the Star Wars. It's just got worse and worse and worse. But what I'm going to show you today is amazing stuff, right? 2015, I think we got it right. And now I gotta beg you to please look at us again because you were burned for so many years, you're like, we're never looking at TFS again. And I'm here to tell you, you need to look again. It's amazing now. And I'll talk to you and show you some of that stuff. I am hyper competitive. Uh, I, at one point, was one of the best air hockey players in the world. I am still hyper competitive. If you think that anyone does something better than Microsoft, I'm at Donovan Brown on Twitter. And you can see it in action. If you go to my Twitter feed right now, it's people pinging me and me actually getting the product owners inside of Microsoft on that thread. Like, if they think that's better, we need to go fix this. And if you're wrong, I'll just send you to the blog post that shows you that you're wrong and that our stuff is actually better than you think it is. And if it doesn't already exist, I'll write it myself. I'm that serious. So if you really want to have a conduit inside of Microsoft, I am at Donovan Brown on Microsoft. I'm very honored because I just got into my new role, and that is my team. Uh, I literally went to Chef and stole their best guy, that's Steven Muraski of PowerShell Frame and DSC, and he also worked at Chef, and I wanted him, so I went and took him. Anyone here use Octopus Deploy? Then you know who that is. That's Damian Brady. I like Damian, so I went and I stole him too. And there's some marketing people in here that are kind of pissed off at me at Microsoft, because that guy worked at Microsoft. He still does, but now he works for me. <laughs> These are the best DevOps guys I could find in the industry, and I brought them all together so that we can make sure that you can get your workloads into Azure as easily as you possibly can. 
I have ops guys represented there. I have infrastructure guys represented there. I wanted to make sure that if you need to get your workload into Azure, I have everyone on my team that can help you do it. So again, if you want to get to all of us at once, just use that hashtag right there. We're all watching it. It comes into our team room every single time you use it, and all of us will go and read that tweet and help you figure out whatever it is that you need to do. Okay? So if you want to get to us, get to us. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, the easiest way to do is go ahead and shoot that QR code. But again, if you need to get to us, definitely get to us. We're here to talk about DevOps. It's something that I'm extremely passionate about. It's what I believe allows you to take what you've learned from Agile and just push it to the nth degree. You're producing increments of shippable code. But how many of you actually can ship it as fast as you produce it? I'm finding very few people can actually do that. And DevOps is that, that, that thing that just allows you just to rub a little DevOps on it and make everything better. And that's what we're going to do. And I'm going to show you how I can do that very, very quickly. Because when I speak about DevOps, people get intimidated. They're like, man, where do I start? There's no way my boss is ever going to let me do that. And I'm going to build four of them from scratch in an hour. If I can do four in an hour, you can do one on Monday. Right? So don't go back and ask for permission. Don't go ask if it's okay if I do this. It's your job to do this. You should have had to ask permission to do it manually the way you do it today. <laughs> right? You should have asked permission to do it where I make mistakes and why we have downtime because I refuse to do automation. And that's what you should have had to ask permission to do. So how dare you go ask permission to do the right thing? And I'm going to show you how to do that right now. At Microsoft, we define DevOps very simply. DevOps is the union of people, process, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to our end users. The most important word there is value. It is not about shipping features. It is not about copying random files to a server. It is not about automation. It is about continuously delivering value to your end users. Value is the key part. Why do I keep stressing that? Because I can deliver value without changing a single line of my application. If it's Cyber Monday on its way, and I run an e-commerce site, do I have to change my app to sustain more simultaneous users? No. My ops team can spring in and scale up or scale out my infrastructure and deliver value to my customers. And that's what we're trying to do. The hardest part is people. Because you guys are here, and hopefully you're going to get it when I'm done, but your peers aren't here. And you're going to go back to work all excited about what I'm going to show you, and they're going to try to shoot it down because they don't get it. And what I'm hoping is they're recording this for you, and you can make them go watch 15 minutes of this, and hopefully they'll start to get what it is that we're talking about. So when I say DevOps from this point forward, that's what I'm actually talking about. This is our North Star at Microsoft. This is what we strive to do with all the tools that we produce for you today. Enough talk. First demo I'm going to do for you is starting inside of Visual Studio. It's a .NET user group. Clearly, we're going to start with .NET inside Visual Studio. But what's really unique about this demo is I will never have to leave Visual Studio to build an entire DevOps pipeline from scratch. And that's what I want to show you how we can do. So let me switch over here real quick. I'm not going to bore you with File New Project. I've already done that. But that literally is what this is. File New Project MVC application with unit test enabled. But it sits only on my machine right now. And what I want to be able to do is upon every commit, I want this code automatically deployed into Azure and I never want to have to leave the IDE to do it. All you have to do is install an extension. So you would go to Tools. You would go to your extension up and updates. And there's one in here for continuous delivery that we've produced that will allow you to do all of that magic directly inside of your IDE. So once my internet catches up here, you're going to see it's right here, Continuous Delivery Tools for Visual Studio. Just add that to your Visual Studio, and now you're able to do the things that I'm about to do here. One of the things that we're going to do is simply right-click on the solution, and then we're going to say continue, configure continuous delivery. What it's doing right now is it's analyzing the repository where my code sits. And we're going to get an error message, but don't be alarmed. All it's saying is that you don't have this under source control. How am I supposed to do continuous integration if you don't even have this in source control? Let's put your code in source control where I can go back in and work on it for you. So like, OK, cool. Let's go ahead and add this to source control. It takes me over here to Team Explorer. Team Explorer is your window inside of your Visual Studio Team Services or Team Foundation Server. You don't have to go there to actually get the value. So what I'm going to do is like, why don't we go ahead and publish a Git repository? It actually knows who I am because I've actually logged in to my IDE. It's then gone ahead and interrogated all the Visual Studio Team Services accounts that I have access to. It found one called Demonstrations, which I actually want to use. And now I'm going to simply put, click on Publish Repository. It's actually creating a team project inside Visual Studio Team Services. A team project is a logical grouping of all the value that we preside or provide inside of VSTS. It's your source control, work item tracking, continuous integration, continuous deployment, package management, test case management, all of it, 
all tied together for you in one nice little bow. So you don't have to go to Jenkins and to Bitbucket and to Jira and to all these other tools and stitch them together yourself. We've already done all the stitching together for you. But don't fear vendor lock-in. If you really want to use Jenkins, you can actually use Jenkins instead and still use everything else that we provide. But you don't actually have to do that. So what it's doing right now is it's creating the project. It's actually pushing my code to that repository right now. Don't worry about this. I'm actually working with the product team on this right now. This happened to me, I sent them an email, that's going to get fixed for you. But it doesn't prevent us from actually working successfully. All I have to do now that I have a project inside of source control is simply right click on it again and start our process over. Now this dialog is going to be a little bit different. It says, okay, now I understand that you're under version control. I see what branch we're working on and I see exactly what project you want me to go to. It knows me so it also knows my Azure subscription which is listing here for me in this dialog. If I wanted to, I could come in here and fine tune the size of the resources that are going to be provisioned for me inside of Azure. If I need a bigger machine or a smaller machine, I actually don't have to go to Azure to actually make those changes directly inside of my project. All these defaults are good, so I'm going to go ahead and click on cancel and simply click on OK. It is now communicating with Visual Studio Team Services and creating a new CI build that will be connected to this Git repository so that every time I check in code, this build will automatically kick off. It will download my code, it will test my code, and it will package it for me so that it can be deployed into Azure. It will then hand it off to release management, which is our deployment technology that will take your code and deploy it to any resource you want on-prem or in the cloud, mobile or otherwise. So if you're doing mobile development and you need to deploy to an Android device, you're doing mobile development and you need to deploy to an iOS device, you can actually do that using Visual Studio Team Services. This is not your daddy's Microsoft. This is a Microsoft that understands Java so well that we have templates out of the box that will build it. It is a Microsoft that understands mobile development so well that we run natively on your Macs and on your Linux machines so that you can do your Android and your iOS development. And what it's done here is it's actually created a new build definition for me and a release definition that I can now take you to if I so want to. So what I'm going to do now is as a developer, I would just commit code and all this magic actually starts to happen. So what I'm going to do here real quick is go ahead and take you into what actually got created for me. So if I come back here, what we're going to see here is this is Team Services, and from VS was the project that was built for me by Visual Studio. If I drill in here, what you're going to see is this rich experience that we give you through this single pane of glass where you can get to everything that you need. We give you a README file in your repository just like you would at GitHub. You're able to modify this in Markdown so your team understands exactly what's happening. This is true Git. The only difference between our Git and the Git you pay for is that we give you unlimited private repos for free. So if you're paying for Git today, you can literally go and fire up one of these accounts for free, import all your repositories, and stop writing that check tomorrow. Unlimited private repos for free. All your tools work exactly the same. They have no idea if it's GitHub or our Git. It's the exact same Git that you use and love, so why pay for it? We also have work item tracking, so we have Kanban boards, we have uh, product backlogs, we have tasks that you can actually break down. In our world inside of Microsoft, everything's not an issue, right? Some things are bugs, some things are features, some things are tasks that need to be completed. It's not just issues all over the place. And we give you that granularity and that flexibility to use the tool the way it fits your organization. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Now what I want to show you is the build that was actually created for you. So this is a build that I did not have to lift a finger to, to create created for me that's already executed and ran my unit test for me. So now I have this rich output upon every check-in. As I add more unit tests, those unit tests will start to be executed for me. I can go in, however, and modify this if I want to. So this is the results, but if I come here, I can actually see the definition. This definition can be modified to my heart's content. I can add code coverage if I need to, I could do some static code analysis, I can do whatever I want with this build, and I can build it on any platform that I want. Gone are the days where it was just .NET on Windows. I can do Linux and I can do Java or I can do Xcode on a Mac. I can do whatever I want anywhere I want with our build system. One thing uh, you'll notice after that summary, if I jump back over here real quick, at the bottom, it shows me that there's a release that's already started. So if I come back over here, scroll back down to the bottom, you'll see that there's a release that's already succeeded. So we've already deployed our code into production without me having to do anything but commit my code inside of Visual Studio. So developers don't need to know that any of this stuff is happening. You don't have to impede them, you don't have to stop them, you do not have to ask for their permission. You just set up the build, every time they commit, we will download it, test it, package it, and attempt to deploy it for them. 
Now, not everyone's ready to deploy directly into production. If you want to, you can go back and add dev and QA and staging and all the other environments you need to build that confidence and faith in the pipeline before it ends up into production. You can even add approvers, which I'll show you a little bit later. So one last thing I want to show you is what actually happened inside of Azure. So if I come over here and go over to my portal, we'll be able to see the resource groups that were created for me. And there'll be one created for me automatically. I never had to come to the portal to be able to do this stuff. So if you're uncomfortable with the Azure portal, you're not sure what resources you need, let Visual Studio take care of all that stuff for you. So if we come down here and we just search for from, you're going to see it's right here. We have a VSTS from Visual Studio, I mean. And you're going to see that there's a website inside of here. If I go and I browse to this particular website, what I should see is the website that I was developing inside Visual Studio. Every change that any team member makes will automatically be deployed to this site so that people can start using it and start delivering that value. You're producing value quickly, and now you can actually deliver that value just as quickly as you produce it. So that's the website that we were just working on, and every change that I make will go there into Azure with no friction. So what actually got produced? Let's look at it from a higher level. We were using ASP.NET into a Git repository. We used team services for our CI and our CD, and we were deploying into a single resource group into Azure every single time. So that took me, what, 10 minutes, and I explained every step of it? Imagine how quickly you could do that tomorrow if you were just focusing on creating a CI, CI, CD system for your project that's inside of Visual Studio. There is no excuse not to do this. There's no reason you need to go ask permission. Instead of going and getting a cup of coffee, do that, and no one will ask you where you were, right? That's how simple it is. But that's only one, and I promise you I'm going to do this four times to prove that you can do this four different ways for four different languages. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go directly inside of Visual Studio Team Services itself so I can give you a more detailed view of how that actually looks. So what we're going to do is come back over here. Let's close all these windows down, close all these tabs. And what I'm going to do is take you back to the home page here, and I'm going to create a brand new team project from scratch. So we'll call this one from VSTS. And I'm going to click on Create. A couple things you're going to notice is first thing it asks me for is, what's your version control? We offer you Git, which is what I'll be using throughout today. But we also offer you TFVC, which is a centralized version control. Think of VSS++, right? But don't worry, not a single line of VSS is in TFS or VSTS, <laughs> right? But it is an enterprise-grade centralized version control system. Another option that it asked me for was, what process do you want to use? Because I can actually choose between three different processes. One of them is Scrum. And if you're a Scrum shop, and I said something like product backlog or product backlog item, you'd nod. In an impediment, you'd get it. And I'd say sprint, and you're like, right on. But if you're an agile team, you wouldn't want me to say those words. You'd want me to say user story, issue, and you work in iterations, not sprints. There's a little bit of a vocabulary change, and some of the rules are slightly different. And our tool actually understands that. If you're still waterfall, we don't like to shame people, so we call it CMMI for code. But you're still waterfall. <laughs> Right? And you can choose that. And we'll give you requirements and change requests and issues and all the other administrivia that you expect to do with Waterfall. We got you covered there, too, until you're ready to migrate over. The tool will literally change its vocabulary to make sure that what you say in your team is what the tool says to you as well. You don't have to map these things across. So I really like that. Now, another thing I really like about Visual Studio Team Services is the way that it guides me to do the right thing. We're all on this DevOps journey together. And a lot of us are confused on where to start and where to go next. I've created a project, and the first thing it's trying to do is say, Donovan, we need you a repository. We need somewhere for your team to store their code. And there's a couple ways that we can go about that, and we list them all here. If you're a command line junkie and you love getting down there nitty gritty with your Git clones and Git branches and all that stuff, knock yourself out. There's the URL you need. All your command line tools are going to work exactly the same. If you're tired of paying for Git, just click on Import here. Come over here and give yourself a little repository you want to go grab. Press on Enter here and watch it literally start importing all the history and everything from the paid repository into this one that we're going to give you for free. Same functionality, just zero cost. And when it brings it all in, I can now leverage that code directly from within my Visual Studio Team Services account. It's already imported it in, has all the history as well, and it's going to navigate me over to my repository which is the branch where I've actually been doing some of my work. Now, it said, Donovan, you have a project. I need a repository. I gave it a repository. Now it's saying, Donovan, we have a repository. Now I need a build. Right? So it's actually guiding me and holding my hand on what should I do next. Next thing you should do is create a build. So let's go ahead and set up a build. 
And when I do this, what happens is it has templates that come out of the box. So I can do .NET if I want to do like, uh, what is that? If I want to do XAML-based development for Windows, WPF development, I can do that. I want to do web development. Maybe I've already graduated up to ASP.NET Core. That's all good. But you're looking at this list saying, yep, that's Microsoft doing Microsoft. Donovan said any language, any platform. So let me scroll down a little bit and show you the Android. So if you've already started doing your mobile development and you're not ready for Xamarin or you didn't choose Cordova or PhoneGap and you started writing native Android development, we got you, right? Just give us your, your project. We'll go build it for you on Linux, Mac, or Windows. So your Java top, and I know all of you have Java somewhere in your organization because it's the plague that just won't go away, right? <laughs> so there's Java in your organization. And what I love about our new build system is I can finally kick down those doors and say, you need to listen to what I say. Because when I walk into the office and I have Microsoft on my chest and I say the word Visual Studio, half the entire audience shuts down. That guy's not talking to me. All .NET and Windows and Microsoft, that's all you guys. I'm a Java developer and I need different tools. I know what tools you need. You need Ant, you need Gradle, and also you need Maven. So guess what? We have all those tools in the box already for you. Matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and use the Maven one just to prove that we can do this stuff. And another thing I want you to do when you're talking to your Java people is make sure that they can use their JUnit test. We can run every single one of those for them. We're going to be able to calculate code coverage using two different engines, whatever engine that they want. Oh, and they're going to say, yeah, that's cool and all, but we use SonarCube. I'm going to wire that up for you too. All right? No excuses. We can do everything that they need with the tools that you already use in some of your other organizations. You don't have to use different tools for each of their different tool sets. So what we're going to do here is we're going to have a lot of fun. We're also going to do Docker. How many people are excited about containers? Everybody loves immutable infrastructure? Let me show you that I can do that too, OK? I'm a big fan of Bower, so I want to make sure that we do that correctly as well. So I'm going to add some tasks here. But before I do, I want to talk to you about what we call agent queues. The ones that start with the word hosted are in Azure already waiting for you. For you to start building, you need to install zero things. You go to visualstudio.com, you create an account for free, and you just import your code and we'll build it on Windows or on Linux. There's a surprise coming that I can't give away right now, but I think you can guess what's coming. Two of the three are already in there. Fill in the blanks. But I can't say that because we're going to announce it at a big event, but I think you get my drift. You will be able to build on any platform that you want without installing a thing. Now, you can also install your own on-premise or in the cloud. And this is really important. When people realize that VSTS is hosted in Azure, their immediate assumption is that I can only deploy to Azure with it. Sort of like the code deploy stuff and the code star stuff that Amazon's doing. It's really geared towards only doing that. But what we allow you to do is deploy anywhere you want. The default queue is for you to install your agents anywhere in the world that you want, on-prem or otherwise, and then register to them. Now, I'm very fortunate to work at Microsoft, and I have this really cool Azure account that I've never seen the bill for. So I build really big machines in there, right? And one of the really big machines I built was my build machine. So we're going to use mine, because it has lots of cores, lots of memory on solid state disk. It builds really, really quickly. And no one is in line for it but me. So we're going to use mine. And that's what I've selected here. So now that I have the agent I want, and we're going to be doing Docker, I don't need these two tasks either. And what I'm going to do now is show you our task library. Our task library is extensive. Almost anything that you can imagine that you want to do is already in here, especially if it relates to Azure. Almost every resource is actually represented in a way that you can deploy it and use it from our tool set. I've just passed my favorite task of all time. You're going to ask or you're going to wonder, I wonder if he could do X or I wonder if he could do Y or Donovan, we have this special tool that we use internally. Can I do that with our build system? That command is my get out of jail free card. I can run any command from the command line, period on Windows, on Linux, and on Mac. So if you already have a tool that you're using today that you call via the command line, but a human being is typing in the parameters, let us do that for you as part of our build and our release on any platform. We can also run Bash. We can also run PowerShell. We can also run Batch scripts. So if you already have a collection of those that you're using to do your deployment, just stop running them manually. Let us run them for you. But this is my get out of jail free card. Show me a CLI, and I'll show you how I can automate it as part of my build and my release system. Okay. If you do not see the tasks that you need in here, then go to our marketplace. Our marketplace is hundreds of extensions that allow you to add additional value to team services. You're going to see names in here like Slack and Octopus Deploy and GitHub and all sorts of cool stuff. Jenkins in installations here. Yarn is in here. If you do not see what you're looking for, 
come to the marketplace first. You just click on the one that you need, you add it to your project for free, and now you have new tasks that you can add to your build and your release. New dashboards that start to light up, new functionality that you've added for absolutely zero dollars and zero cents because people are extending this platform. They're really, really easy to write. If you know PowerShell or you know Node.js, you already know how to write these. Every single task that we've written, the ones that I scroll through in the box, are all open source. You can go to GitHub right now and see every single line of those so that you can use those as examples of how you're going to write your own. That's how I learned mine. There was one that was close but just wasn't right. I went and I cloned the repo, and next thing you know, I had my own task in the box that did exactly what I needed to. Okay? So the system is extremely extendable, and you need to make sure that you remember that. So let's go over ahead and finish our, our pipeline here. So I need Bower so I can do my front end, and I also need Docker as well. So I'm going to add these two Docker tasks. Bower needs to run first so that I can resolve everything. And let's go take a closer look at this Maven task. It obviously understands what a POM file is. It will find it and build the package. It intentionally tries to run my unit test for me, so it's going to find my JUnit test and run them. I'm a big fan of code coverage, and I can actually calculate it with two different engines. I'll use Jococo for this one. And then I said, make sure that they know that they can do SonarCube. Now, we do not offer SonarCube as a service inside of Azure, but you can stand up your own on any machine that you want. So what I did is I spun up a VM in Azure, and I just simply installed SonarCube on it. So all I have to do now is tell Team Services where my SonarCube server is so that it can then send all my technical debt to that server. So let me go ahead and do that. And when I do this, I'm simply going to go and configure a connection between my SonarCube and Visual Studio Team Services. And in doing so, I can actually show you lots of the other things that we can create connections to. It's not just simple SonarCube. If you want to go and do Kubernetes, or you have other Azure services, you want to go directly from GitHub, you can actually do all of that. But all I need is a generic connection here, and I'm going to basically fill in the information for my SonarCube. So that's the URL to my SonarCube. Admin is my user, and there's my password. Hold on, let's do that. Password, there we go. And let's go ahead and click on OK. So now I have a connection between Visual Studio Team Services and my SonarCube. I can come back over here, click on Refresh, and in this dropdown will now be my SonarCube. So now every time I do a build, my SonarCube information is going to be updated. There will actually be a connection from my SonarCube results back down into my build summary, so I don't even have to go to SonarCube if I don't want to. The connection between SonarCube and our build is so good that if I have gates inside of my SonarCube, I can actually have them fail my build if those gates don't pass, or again, so people can't wiggle out of stuff. Now it's time to start working with Docker. For those who are not familiar with Docker, the first goal is to build an image. You use a Docker file, you define what your image needs to be based off of, you copy files into that image, and you bake it. And then what you need to do is store that image in what we call a registry. It's basically a place where you can store them, and then you can pull them down on a host, where you actually want to run them inside what we call a container. So what we're going to do now is build an image, and then store that image in a registry. Okay? Step number one, build an image. I'm going to go ahead and wire up my Azure subscription too as well. So I'm going to go ahead and pick on this guy and say authorize. While that's authorizing, I'm going to come down here and fill out a few bits of information. So I need a new image name. So the beginning of that image name is a registry that I have in Azure. The most popular registry on the earth is Docker Hub. It's basically run by the Docker people, and it allows you to store registries there. But just like everything else, eventually you have to start paying for it. Azure actually has something called Azure Container Registry, which is our own private registry that you can stand up inside of Azure. And it makes perfect sense. If my hosts are going to be in Azure, then why would I want my images anywhere else but Azure? It puts them network close to each other so that when I want to deploy new versions, it's instant versus me having to go over the network and get to Docker Hub and bring it down to my host in Azure. So what I'm going to do is use my own. Another thing that I can actually do here is I can come down and say, what server do I want to build this on? Now, I chose my own default server for my builds. Had I chosen the Linux one, it actually has the Docker tools on it already, so you wouldn't have to even configure this portion. But again, I have a cool Azure account. I built my own Docker host. It's really, really fast, so we're going to configure mine. So what we're going to do here is come over here, and when I click on this plus, I'm going to go ahead and put in my URL for my Docker host. And now this is where I have to do a lot of typing, so forgive me. These are certificates that are on your hard drive. And if you've ever seen these certificates, they're really, really long. And what I have to do is now type them in. So just, just bear with me while I type in all this information. OK, so now that I have all the keys typed in, what I need to do now is simply save this information. And what that's going to do now is allow them to authenticate against my server. So let me make sure I type that right. I type kind of fast, but sometimes I, no, nope, that looks good. No, I think I got it right. OK, got it. 
So now I have a build. I have the ability to build an image. The next step is for me to go off and actually store this image inside of a registry. So what I'm going to do now is change my action from build an image to push an image. And I'm going to need a registry, which happens to use this subscription. And I happen to have an ACR already in the cloud, and it's already found it for me. I need the image to match the same image that I just did, the same image name. And then down here at the bottom, all I need to do is say where to go get that image, and it's actually on the server that I just configured. So now I run Bower, I run Maven, and then I run the rest of this good stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and save and queue this. And if I've done everything right, what we should be able to do now, if we wanted to, is actually watch this running. So this is actually going off using the agent that I have on premise that I built myself, and it's running a Java build. Again, it, what's really important is that the experience that I'm going to get on the other side, the summary that I get is as rich as virusdoing.net. We don't give you some abbreviated or second class experience because you're doing Java. We give you the exact same experience you would expect if you were doing .NET, if you were targeting Windows. We want to make sure that everyone in your organization feels included when we're actually doing the work that we're doing for all of development. We don't want you, again, using one set of tools for one team and another set of tools for, our, for your Windows team. The tools that we build are for any language and any platform. If you remember nothing about our time together, I need you to leave here understanding that Microsoft is now for any language targeting any platform. I spent six weeks in Europe, seven countries, 37 stops, just so that I could tell them that we do any language in any platform. And I need to make sure that you guys pr promote that forward for me as well. So now we've already run our Maven build. We're now going off and talking to our Docker host and building an image. Once that image actually gets built, it's then going to be stored inside of my Azure Container Registry. And that's going to be safely stored and tagged such that I can then ask for it later when I go to my release and say, hey, I need you to run this for me on a particular server. So now that I have a build complete, if I come back over here to my summary, I want you to point out a couple of things. I ran the test just like I did for .NET. I calculated code coverage, which I didn't even do for .NET. So this is a really rich experience. And down here, you can see the SonarCube integration. All the technical debt that I sent to SonarCube has actually been reflected back in here. If I click on this, it'll take me into my SonarCube. I can log in here real quick. And now I get this a rich, amazing experience with all the SonarCube that your Java teams are going to insist that they have access to. This is what they think are going to trip me up. They're like, oh, no, but we need SonarCube. He's never going to be able to do that. We do that. Okay. So any language, any platform. Now what I want to do, and it's guiding me, Xin, it's saying, Donovan, You've done a build. Now it's time for us to create a release. So let's go ahead and create a release. Just like with our build system, our release system runs on Windows, Linux, and Mac. It has templates that come right out of the box that allow you to be able to deploy anywhere that you possibly could want to. And if you want to, you can start with an empty template, which means I appreciate the templates, but I kind of have an idea of what it is I want to do. Let me just go ahead and do that myself. We're going to go ahead and push straight to production because I'm brave like that. So we're going to call this environment prod, and we're going to come in here and make sure everything looks good. It does look good. Inside this environment, we're going to go to our task. Just like before, I want to make sure this runs against my host because it's quick. And now what we're going to do is add new task. Just like we did before, I'm going to go and find my Docker task. And now I'm going to run two different tasks, and I'll explain why here in just a second. If I come over here now and I take you to this particular URL, it should come up with hello world here in just a second. I'll make sure I type that in correctly. Do, do, do. Demo. Press enter. That's going to load here in just a second. While that's loading, I'm going to go back and finish my build. But we're going to come back to that tab. It should just say hello world in there. Step number one is I need to stop the image that's actually running there right now, because there is an image running there that just says hello world. So the first thing I'm going to do is run an arbitrary command. So I'm going to come over here, change this from build image to run an arbitrary Docker command. From here, I'm then going to say I need to use the command I want to run is here. Remove Java. So I have a container already running on my host called Java Demo. I can't start another one on the exact same port because this one's already using port 8080. I need to stop that one first, and that's essentially what I'm telling it to do. Hey, go on that host, stop it for me, and then after you stop it, we're going to fire up another one. And I want you to do all this work on that exact same host I configured in my build. Now what I want you to do is actually come over here and actually run an image. So here I'm going to change this from build to run. I'm going to come back up here and say I want you to use the same Azure subscription as before. And I want you to pull this information from the same registry we were talking about before. 
and here is the name of the image I want you to go back in and get. The container name, as I said a moment ago, is Java Demo. I want you to run this on port 8080, and I want you to do all this magic on the exact same server we were talking about a second ago, which for some reason is still not loading. So I'm going to save this real quick and see if I can get this guy to load. So just that easily, I'm able to stop and start a new image. Let's come over here and see if I can get to one of my other apps that are running on that same one. Um, uh, let's see, that's not where I want, I want to do. Mm -mm -mm. Me see. Something is not happy here. Mm -mm -mm. Give me one second. Demo gods are not wanting to play nice. Don't tell anyone I did this. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do something I'm not supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's see if. Uh, Yeah, we're having some serious issues with my host, though, but it still doesn't want to work. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, I know. I have no idea why that's not working. But we're going to deploy it anyway, see if it lights up. So one of the things that this build is already, this release is already connected to my build. So every single time my build completes, this release is automatically going to start and try to deploy the code to it. Now, what we're going to do now, though, is we're going to start one manually. And there's times you might actually want to do this. For example, if you deploy the latest and greatest version of your code and it's not so latest and greatest and you kind of wish you could go back as, please put back the old code because the new code wasn't as good as I thought it was, you can actually come into our release system. Here, it will list all of the builds that we've ever done. And you'll be able to pick the build that you know is good and redeploy it over what you thought was good instead. But we're going to go ahead and start one of these manually. So if I go ahead and queue this real quick, and if I jump over here quickly enough, what I should be able to see is the, build, the release actually running just like I saw the build running. I have to be quick because Docker doesn't take much time to actually deploy. So if I run over here really quick, you can see the agent is downloading stuff. It's running the command against my Docker host, so it clearly was able to stop the other one. And it started the new one. So I'm going to try one last time to see if I can get this... Uh, to fire up here. If not, I'm not sure why my network's not working. There we go. So I promise with this, I'll show you what this used to say. It used to say, let's just do, uh, and I'm going to change this to port 3000 because I have a node application too. So it used to say that, right? For some reason, it was hosed up and it wasn't allowing us to show it, but it said that a second ago. I do my deployment and now it changes it into this. So that's the beauty of Docker, is that you can simply just swap out one application for another application. And all I needed to do were the commands that I actually configured for you. So again, why it wasn't firing up the first time, I'm not sure, but you can see exactly what the end result was be. Take an app that just says hello world, deploy a completely different container here. So this is pure Java Spring MVC application using all the best practices I can learn from Java to actually apply this to what we do here at Microsoft as well. So if I go you back to the PowerPoint real quick, this is what you just saw happen. We took a Java repo from GitHub and we imported it inside of Team Services. We then were able to use CI and CD from inside Team Services to build a Maven project, a Docker image, push it to a repository. And then, using release management, pull it down to a Docker host and start running it. This could have just as well been Kubernetes or Swarm or DCOS. We don't care where you want to run your images. You can orchestrate them however you want. We even have support for Docker now inside of App Service. So we can actually spin up a an image, like a, basically app service is like a virtual directory, but we can now also run them on Linux. And if you choose Linux as the base OS, you can now run Docker containers inside your app service, which is really, really cool as well. So it's a nice way for you to get started. So two down, two to go. For the people who live inside of the Azure portal, we don't want you to have to leave the Azure portal to be successful with DevOps. We don't want you to have to wait for your dev teams to do the right thing. If they keep asking you to manually deploy binaries into, the, into your resources, you can basically go into the Azure portal and start the pipeline yourself without ever telling them that you're doing so. Let me show you what I mean. So what we're going to do is jump back into a browser here. Let me close all these different tabs. And I'm going to close Chrome before I get in trouble. And now what we're going to do is we're going to go over to the Azure portal. From the Azure portal, I can find any app service that I already have configured, and I happen to have one configured for this very purpose. And this would be a web app that I would historically be manually deploying into for my dev team. My dev team said, hey, Donovan, we need a web app. So I went manually provisioned them a web app. And they're like, Donovan, every couple of weeks, they send me a new zip file that I have to go and upload to this website because they haven't automated it for me. But instead of me waiting on them to finally automate the process from inside the Azure portal, I can simply click on continuous delivery. 
And now, from within the Azure portal, I can reach back into their team services account and create the build and the release necessary to automatically deploy their code into Azure without them sending me binaries anymore. So I can simply click on Configure. And I'm going to do something slightly differently here. So when it says choose your source repository, clearly I can use team services, but a lot of people already have code inside of GitHub. If you search back about a week or so, I got in a fight with a guy on Twitter who swore up and down that I couldn't do open source. So I'm going to do this against GitHub just so that you guys can help me tell that guy he has no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> if you guys want to build from, from GitHub, you can build directly from GitHub. So it's already gone in, and it's traversed my account for me. And what I'm going to do here is choose ASP.NET Core. Let's do a sample core application, the master branch, and I'm going directly from GitHub. I'm not using our Git. I'm using GitHub instead. Now I can come over here and set up my continuous delivery. I can do all these different types of languages, but we chose .NET Core, so let's choose Core instead. We're going to go ahead and choose my demonstrations account. Now we still need a team services account for the build and the release to live inside of, but the source code will never be inside that team services account. The source code will still be inside of GitHub. And every commit to that GitHub repository will start the build and the release inside of team services. So again, it allows you to have an open source project, but still use the power of Visual Studio team services to do the build and the release so that you are in, in complete control. So I'm going to go ahead and click on OK. Now for the interest of speed, I'm not going to configure, but I'm going to talk to you about the fact that we can do load test. And what this will do is provision an entire duplicate of your website, deploy there first, run load test against it, and when they pass, then deploy it over into production. But it takes longer for the demo, so I'm going to go ahead and skip that for now. The other thing that it actually do for you is allow you to do deployment slots. If you've purchased the right size of VM for your website, we'll allow you deployment slots, which means I can deploy into one slot while everyone else is still looking at production. If today, when you deploy your website, you have to take it offline first, you have to put up that we'll be back in a minute website page. We all know that page, right? It says offline site. And everyone's going to that offline site, so they're not getting value anymore. But what you can do with deployment slots is actually deploy as long as it takes to the deployment slot while everyone is still using your production website. And then when you're done, you just swap the slots. It's an IP VIP swap. And then everyone starts seeing the new value. They never saw a single second of downtime. That's deployment slots. I'll show you these in more detail later, so I won't configure them here either. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to click on OK. Azure, knowing who I am and given the information that I just told it, is now going over into Team Services and creating another CI build for me and another CD pipeline that's going to automatically deploy the code right into Azure for me from GitHub. I have two or three open source projects. You're going to be introduced to them in the next demo that I actually do this for every day. Whenever I get a pull request, I review the pull request, I commit it to master, and Team Services springs into action and deploys that code for me to two different places. One of them is into NPM, and the other one is into the PowerShell gallery. Because I'm going to introduce you to two little tools here that I think makes this even easier. Because the whole thing is that, yeah, Donovan, you've done this demo so many times, you know where to click. Sure, it's easy for you to go and do this demo and do four of them in an hour. The next one shows you just how easy it is, and anyone in this room can do it absolutely for free. So now it's already created a build definition for me, a release definition for me, and even triggered the build. So it actually started the whole process for me. So from here, I can jump to that build definition. Now what's really important is that where I pulled the source code from. So it's currently in progress. I can come over here, and I can actually see that it's actually running successfully. So let's go ahead and look at the definition here. When you come over here, you can actually see where I'm getting the source code from. I'm getting the source code from GitHub. I did not import it like I did before. You can go to GitHub and still see this repository, make a change, and that change will make, actually start this off. If you're already using Subversion, as you'll notice, we don't force you to leave the source control that you're currently in. Microsoft is notorious for vendor lock-in. We love to get you on one tool and force you to use everything else that we have. And I've been fighting that reputation for a really long time. This is the type of screens that help me say, nope, that's not the case. If you want to use Bitbucket, we put that under remote repo. If you want to use GitHub, you can use GitHub. If you're already using Subversion, fine. If you want to use our version control, that's great. Use whatever version control works for you, but don't sacrifice the CI system and the CD system you use just because you chose some other source control system, okay? Because I really do believe today our build system is the best build system on the planet. Jenkins kicked our ass for years. Why? Because our build system was just that bad. It was horrendously painful to use. Any consultants in here for TFS? You love the XAML based build. Why? Because you make tons of money. I made tons of money when I was a consultant. Why? Because it was so hard to use. You had to hire me to make it do anything other than .NET. 
And you would. And I'd happily come in there and bastardize your build to no end. And then you were stuck with me. And I just made mountains of money off the XAML build system. It was great for consultants. It was horrible for customers. right? And we had to go fix that. That's why I think Jenkins is in every account that I go to today. Because people got so afraid of what we did in the past. That is not this build system. And if you really want to replace it, you can actually replace it. Our release system, the sister to this product, can actually pull directly from Jenkins. It's that prevalent. We understand that. And we don't want you to have to throw away the investment you already have in Jenkins to start using the power that we have here at Microsoft. So if you really want to stay in Jenkins, it's already working. Don't, it's not broken. Don't fix it. Stay in Jenkins, and I'll show you how we can actually wire that up to our release system as well. But this is simple, .NET Core. .NET Restore, Build, Test, and Publish. We're ready to rock and roll. So let's go back over here to the summary. And from the summary, what we should be able to see here is that we actually have a successful build just like we did before. And we actually have a release that's already succeeded into production. So let's go and look at that release here real quick as well. So this is where I wanted to show you that we can actually help you do other, other repositories. You don't have to get your code directly from us. So if I were to come over here and edit this, what I'm going to show you is the, the way that this was actually built. Here I can add additional artifacts. And from the artifacts, I can add from Jenkins. I can use from package management. I can use from GitHub. You don't even have to compile the code. If you're doing something like Node.js that really doesn't need any compilation, you just do an NPM package, zip it, and deploy it, you can actually do that because there's really no build step unless you're running unit tests and things like that. If you want to do that, use our build system for that, and then take the package and deploy it from here. But again, if you're already in Jenkins, don't feel the need to leave. This is not vendor lock-in. I do believe we have the best tools, and you should end up with a fully Microsoft stack, not because it's integrated, but because we have the best build and the best release and the best package management on the planet. If you don't believe that's true, I'm at Donovan Brown on Twitter. I'm that serious about it. Literally tweet at me at stuff that you don't think is good, and I will add the PM to that Twitter feed so that they can actually go and address your concerns. Okay? So I just wanted to prove to you that I can actually do from different source control systems as well. This is a very simple deployment. It literally just uses app service. So now if I go back over to my Azure portal again, uh, that was here, and I go back to my overview, and I click on Browse, we're actually going to be able to see the code that was deployed. Now the, the, QA, the, the, the ops guy now is freed. The time that they were using taking zip files and copying to the developers is all gone now. Every time a developer makes a change, that change automatically shows up in Azure. The IT pros no longer have to lift their finger. Stop waiting on them to do the right thing. You can actually force the right thing upon your team from within the Azure portal. Now, I didn't actually enable the load test, but I wanted to show you what you can actually produce. So you can actually run load tests in a completely different resource group. And if those load tests actually pass, then we'll then go ahead and deploy into production. We use .NET Core directly from GitHub, and we use Team Services again for your CI and your CD. Now, those demos all take me about 15 minutes to do a piece when I'm not talking about what they do. And the last one is my favorite run. I'm a Windows guy. I've been a Windows guy for over 20 years, so I love right-clicking on stuff. Right? To me, that's like the best thing in the world that you can do is right-click, and there's all this magic. But I'm starting to re-embrace the PowerShell and the command line. I understand that when you do that, you can write scripts that automate a lot of stuff that you would normally do yourself. So to re-embrace the command line, I really wanted to get inside there and start writing tools that made my life a lot easier. So the last demo I'm going to do for you, we're going to be in PowerShell almost the entire time. Everything I'm about to show you is open source. You can contribute to it and make everyone's life in this room a lot easier than it is today. This is the one that allows you zero excuses to go back to work tomorrow and actually do this stuff yourself. Because you don't have to know VSTS. You don't even have to know Visual Studio. You never have to go into the Azure portal to build an entire DevOps pipeline. So let's get started. The tool I'm going to be using is called Yo Team. Yo is short for Yeoman. It's a generator open source project that you can go on GitHub right now. And if you were to type things like Yo ASP or Yo Express, it would basically stamp out an entire application for you. All the files you need for a Express application or all the files you need for a Node.js application. But I'm a DevOps guy. Code, whatever. I need a pipeline. I need a project. I need a repo. I need a CI and a CD build. That's what I need. So that's what I did is I said, I'm going to take Yeoman and extend it beyond what it's actually designed to do and allow it to build an entire pipeline. So what I'm going to do here is tell it what account I want it to use, give it the password to that account, and now it's going to go off and interrogate that account and say, hey, I see that you have four different repositories or queues in there, the same four I showed you earlier because it's actually using the API to go and get that information in real time. I'm going to go ahead and use default like I've told you before. I've already done Java, I've already done .NET Core, and I've already done the full framework, so why don't we go ahead and do Node.js as well, just to prove that I can. 
I'm going to do Node.js. We're going to call it Node Demo. And here, you're seeing some of my future work. If you were to go and download this right now, you're going to be using version 3.4. It does not have the container instances in it yet. OK? I'm working on that right now, trying to figure out how I like it. I think I'm actually going to replace that with Kubernetes instead and just skip ACI altogether. But if I talked about it earlier, and I saw someone light up when I say that you could run Docker images inside of App Service, that actually already works. Uh, I run a website for my team. It's actually running a Docker image inside of this particular container so that we know how we use it. I'm going to go ahead and do App Service. Now it's going off and it's actually interrogating all of my Azure subscriptions and saying, which one would you like me to deploy into for you? I simply choose the one from the list and press OK. This command line tool is now going off into Team Services and creating everything for me. It's creating the project, the repo. It's going to clone the repo to my machine. It's going to give me all the source code that, Yo team I mean, that, that Yeoman loves to do. It's going to allow me to commit that code and start an entire CI CD pipeline. It's connecting my Azure account to my Team Services account for me automatically. It's then going to go off and create a CI build for me and a continuous delivery pipeline. Everything that you need to go from zero to DevOps in about four minutes, depending on your network speed. And you can do it for any of those four languages. Why does it do .NET Core, .NET Full, Node.js, and uh, Java? Because Donovan knows .NET Core, .NET Full, Node.js, and Java. If you know PHP, I am begging you to give me a pull request. If you know Ruby, I am begging you to give me a pull request. Any Go programmers out there, please give me a pull request. I don't have time to learn all those languages. But I do have time to help you build a pipeline to deploy that code into Azure for you. We'll add it to this project, and then all those languages will automatically be enabled to do the exact same thing that I just did for this one. So all I have to do now is basically CD into my Git repository and push my changes into my remote repository. Now magic is starting to happen. And I know a lot of people are thinking that was pretty cool. But now he's going to uh, run away from the command line screaming and go back into a safe world of an IDE or into a website. But I'm not. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to just type git project right here on the command line. And now you're going to see all the projects that you and I have been playing with here just a moment ago. The node demo is the one that I just created from the command line that was not there a moment ago. What I'm using now is a PowerShell module called team that I wrote in company to Yo Team so that I could actually do everything that I could possibly do from a DevOps pipeline directly from within a command line. I can now automate all these things that I would normally have to go and manually do myself. For example, here's an example of all the different types of commands that are inside this particular module. You can get your approvals, create new builds, start new builds, create new release definitions. You can go and find out what your your URL for your Git repository is. There's all sorts of stuff that you can now do directly from the command line without having to jump to the IDE or jump to the website, navigate through the website to find that bit of information just to return back to the command line to get your job done. Now you can stay in the command line the entire time. The majority of these tasks need to know the project of which you're trying to target before you ask it the questions. I got tired of having to type in the project name on every command, so I created a shortcut. So you can actually say, why don't you set the default project for me? And I just tab, and it goes and lists for me all the projects that I actually have. So I don't have to worry about fat fingering it or remembering how to spell it. I just choose the one that I want and press Enter. Now, every command that I run will be against that particular project. For example, I can say, get me the build. And it will show me all the builds that have already run against that project. That build ran because I committed code and I have CI configured. Now, if that build had failed, what's really cool is to see what went wrong, I don't even have to leave. Using normal PowerShell, I would do a git build. I would then pipe this to another command that says git build log, and it will dump the entire log right here inside of the command line for me. So I would see the error as the last thing on my screen. I don't have to go again and comb through logs and comb through UIs to figure out why my build failed. I would be able to see it right here on the screen, take an action, commit a change, and instantly be more productive. Now, because I did a build, what should have happened after that? I should have had a release. So I can do a git release. And I can see that there's actually a release running. But you can't see how many environments there are. You can't see where in the pipeline it actually is. But using PowerShell, you actually can. So what I can do is actually say, why don't you expand the environments for me? Using a pipe operator, send that to select object and show me the environments again. Now I can actually see exactly how many environments I have, where we are in the actual pipeline, and if we're moving forward or not. Now, some of you are thinking, man, it went into dev and then now it's into QA. It's actually not. In progress means I'm waiting for an approval. 
because release management actually allows you to pause your automated pipeline and wait for human beings to say, should I continue or should I stop? And right now, I don't even have to leave. I can just simply say, why don't you get for me all my approvals that are waiting? And now you can see, Donovan, we're waiting on you. We have an approval to go into QA. We've already successfully gone into dev. Now what do you want me to do? And as I said before, I can use normal PowerShell. I can say, get me the approvals. Let's pipe that into the set approval command and then set the status to whatever I want. And again, I can cycle through all the available status, hit on approve, and now my code is now rushing into the QA environment. Just imagine the way that you're going to be able to automate the things that you normally have to do. You could write scripts and bots and all sorts of cool stuff to go and do these approvals for you versus you having to do them manually. So now I've been able to see my builds, my releases, do my approvals all from within the command line. But I want to prove to you that this isn't just some magic and that I've just kind of spoofed all this stuff. So why don't we go ahead and move over into the IDE here or the website so you can see exactly what was created. So we're going to close all these other tabs. No, I don't need you to save anything. And now what you're going to be able to see is that there's a repository that was already created. This is the code that was given to me by Yo Team. I have a build definition here. And again, this is Node.js, right? This is not a not .NET or Microsoft product that we're actually trying to build here. So if I go over to my build and I go to my summary, the experience that you get is the experience that you would expect from .NET. I ran all your tests. These are Mocha tests. And I did code coverage with Istanbul. And if you're a Node developer, you know what those words mean. If you're not a Node developer, you have no idea what I'm talking about right now, right? But those are actually tools, one for running unit tests and one for calculating code coverage on unit tests that have integrated inside of a Microsoft product as if they had been there their entire life. We want to give the exact same rich experience to everyone. I did your code. I even calculated code coverage for you. And down here, I'm showing you that we're actually progressing your release. So now, again, like I've done you so many other times, if I come over here and go to my portal, we're now going to see new resources. And I'm going to show you one other thing before we get finished here. The resources that exist now in Azure did not exist before I started. Nothing was in there with this resource name. So what I'm going to do now is I called it Node. And you can see I have a dev environment now and a QA environment. If I click on this, you're actually going to see inside there, there's a website, there's application insights, and a service plan. How did that stuff get there? It got there using a best practice called infrastructure as code. I actually have a file that defines what the infrastructure should look like where I want to deploy my application. I can go and delete this resource group, run my build again, and it will reappear. And it will automatically deploy successfully in there. Just imagine a disaster recovery scenario. Today, if you have an entire region go down, is some poor guy going into the Azure portal and clicking their life away as fast as they can trying to get everything back the way it was? You shouldn't have to do that. What you can do instead is come over to release management, go over to our release product, and actually give it the file that you want, and it will then go and deploy that infrastructure for you upon every single deployment. So here, if I come in here, this says, Donovan, tell me what you need in Azure. And I'm going to do one of two things. I'm going to go create it for you, or I'm going to verify that it's there as you want it to be. If there's anything wrong, I'll fix it for you. And once I know that your infrastructure is there and safe, I will then go and happily deploy your application inside that infrastructure. If you want to, go and delete that. Matter of fact, there's a task that I can use to go delete it from my release. And people do that. They stand it up, they deploy their application into it, they run unit tests, they run automation tests, they run load tests, and then they kill it because they don't want to pay for resources that they don't need anymore. Think about the money that you're going to be able to save by being able to provision and then destroy all the resources that you need automatically inside of Azure. That's the power that we have. And all you have to know how to do is type Yo Team, and you can have all of this in four to five minutes. There is no excuse not to do this. If you go to work tomorrow and you hem and hum, I'm looking over your shoulder, right? And just say, nope, Donovan said I can do this. I don't have to ask permission because this is your job. If I hire a developer and they manually deploy my code out into production, I'm very, very pissed off. That's not your job. Your job is to be efficient. Your job is to continue to deliver value. If you want to go ask permission for something, you better come ask me if you can do it manually, right? Because this is what I expect of you, and I'm telling you right now that you can go back to work tomorrow and do it, okay? So if you guys can do me a favor, this is what we actually produced. Three environments, we had approvals throughout the environments, and you got all this by simply typing Yo Team. What if you can do for me is, I thought I'd save some slides in here, but I didn't. I'm going to show you one other slide I need you to go and do for me real quick. I go all over the world doing these things, and this is the slide I need you to see. I just had it hidden. 
If you could go to that particular website for me, why does it not let me hide it? This is where you can go back in and tell the people at Microsoft that we like Donovan or we like people like Donovan to continue coming and sharing what Microsoft is doing. If you don't go there, we will assume that no one gave a crap about this and we will stop sending Donovan Browns all over the world to come and talk to you. If you hated it, I also do value constructive criticism, right? Just don't say he sucks. Just say he sucks because, and then I can do whatever the because is to make it better, right? So please, I, I really do value constructive criticism. Please let me know what I can do better. Please let Microsoft know if you still want us to come around. Just go ahead. It's only four questions. There's no PII on it at all. There's no personal information. It just lets us know if you found it was valuable uh, and if you want us to continue to keep coming up. So that's all I had. So thank you so much, but I'm willing to answer questions. So thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> So does anyone have any questions whatsoever? So those are the GitHub repos, by the way. So if you want to contribute to Yo Team, it's the first link. If you like the PowerShell module, it's the second link. A lot of people ask me, so Donovan, how do I get that PowerShell module inside of PowerShell? You literally start your PowerShell console as administrator, and you type install module, and the name of it is literally team. And it'll just come down, and you'll be able to do all the stuff that I just showed you uh, inside of PowerShell as well. Yo Team, there's actually... I should have put my own blog on here. DonovanBrown.com has a really good blog post on how to set up Yo Team. So, a question? Uh, yeah, I use uh, Team Sitting. Uh, okay. Deployed Azure, a number of websites to the, to the Azure slots. Sure. After that, complete successfully, I run a PowerShell script as part of the deployment process. Yep. Um, that all works great. This is better. Yep. But Thank you. Yes. So, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, da, da, da. I think it's might be. Where are you? I think it might actually be this one. Let's see. Mm -mm -mm. Nope, not that one. Let me find it for you. But the answer is yes. We have a task for that. App service manage. Here we go. So you can swap slots. You can stop a slot. You can do all sorts of cool stuff. Yeah. So what I would do, um, and I tell a lot of people to do this, you can actually stop a slot without affecting the other slots. So if you ever had the situation where you had a file that was locked, yes, that's a pain in the ass, right? That's why these tasks exist. So if, um, let me show you where that answer is. Because we get it a lot, right? I see it on Stack Overflow all the time. Like, Donovan, I'm, I'm trying to use deployment slots, but it fails because there's a file locked because it's actually being held by the worker process. Um, and I believe there is a blog post on here that will actually show you how to do that. Mm -hmm. Let me go back. Because what I do instead is I stop my staging slot. I deploy in there, and no files will ever be locked because I literally stop the process that's running that slot. Safely deploying that environment, I fire that environment back up, and then I swap my slots over. <laughs> Works 100% of the time, right? So every time I see those post on Stack Overflow, I'm like, damn it, why do you just do this, right? It works 100% of the time because you'll see someone from the product group swear up and down that you can do the check the offline box or all that nonsense, and it never freaking works. So I love my product team, but just do what I'm talking about here. Just tell the, tell the slot to stop and then start the slot back up again. But the tasks are already in there. Okay. But I'll, I'll try to find that blog post for you. Oh, yeah, and again, if you really want to use Jenkins, I teach you how to do that. So, again, we're not trying to force you to do anything. Uh, do, do, do. Do, do, do. But it is definitely in here. But I, I'll find it for you. If you follow me on Twitter, I'll tweet it. A link to it so you can actually see it so I don't waste anyone's time. Anyone else have any questions? I have a question about the price. The price, okay. Uh, how much the, you mentioned the one time go to the Visual Studio come and register for free, but actually, how much I'm going to pay for service or okay. Azure Great. usage? What, okay, so price? what you pay for your Azure consumption is completely separate from VSTS, so let's just focus on VSTS. Everyone in this room can literally go to visualstudio.com right now and create an account absolutely for free. That's not a bluff. There's no gimmick there. You and four of your buddies can now join that account absolutely for free and start developing the next amazing app without paying anything. That sixth person you want to add, we're going to take you to the cleaners. 
right, and make all of our money back. No, we're going to charge you like less than $10. It's, it's really, really insignificant amount of money. But what's really cool is that if this is a .NET user group, chances are everyone in this room has an MSDN or access to an MSDN, which means you already get it for free. So even when you get five people for free, if the people you've already added have an MSDN, you still have five other people you can add for free. It's five non-MSDN users that you can add to that account for free. Right? So every MSDN user doesn't count against your quota. So literally, if you already have an MSDN, you already have all this stuff that you have. Now, as far as build goes, the hosted build agents that I showed you, I think we give you 240 minutes as part of the free, and then we'll start charging you for additional minutes of your build. But there's a, there's a loophole that I'm glad to tell you about. That default one that I just showed you, you can actually install our build agent on a machine under your desk and register that to Team Services. You can build on that as much as you want for free. Right? So again, you don't have to pay for build if you don't want to. You can actually install our agent, one of them. We only give you one of them. right? We don't let you have a, a whole cluster. We've got to make money eventually. So we have one of them. right? And if you can live with that one machine, you can literally build on that machine until your heart's content. And you'll never have to pay for our build service, our release service, or, our, uh, or anything else that you see there. I think there's a charge for package management. I think that's also above like five users, though. right? So it's, we're, really, we're doing our best to just give you this stuff. Because to us, all roads lead to Azure. Okay, so this is just a tool to get you to Azure. Okay. Does that answer the question? Okay, good. No problem. I thought I saw someone else's hands trying to go up. Go ahead. Can you just show how to put some of the applications inside data into the dashboard? Oh, sure. That's a good question. So you're talking about dashboards inside of Team Services? I, I, I don't know why I didn't show that. So let me go ahead and show you that real quick. So for example, what I can do is Everyone has a dashboard that's here, and you can actually customize this dashboard. There's a couple cool things that you can do. Let me go back to my build. I'll start from there. And from my build, I can actually pin my build to my dashboard. And then I can go to my release as well, and I can pin my release to my dashboard. And then we're going to go back in there, and we're going to customize that. So what I'm going to do now is come over here and say, add this to my dashboard. And if I had multiple dashboards, they would obviously be listed. And now for my dashboard, you're going to see that I have two more tiles there. Down here at the bottom, I have a release, I have a build tile, and I have a release tile that's loading at the moment. And these are interactive, so I can now click on these and jump directly into that. So this is what we normally have on the big screen in our team room. That shows us what the status of our last build was, what our last release was, and I can bring up this exact same view on my desktop and then click on it and jump into that particular release. But we can do a lot more than this. So if I go ahead and click on this, and click on plus, there's a whole library of widgets that you can add to this particular dashboard. And these widgets not only come out of the box, but those marketplace extensions I told you about, many of those add additional widgets. So there's one for application insights, there's one for hockey app, there's all these cool extensions that add widgets that you can then just drag and drop over here and configure them to do whatever you want them to do. They also are very, very easy to write, right? So if you know HTML and CSS, you can actually write your own extension and pull in data from anywhere that you want to pull in that data from. Does that answer? Yeah. Awesome. Oh, no problem. Yeah, this is, a, this is pretty cool. Let me see if I have a cooler one for you. So it's a joke, so don't want to get offended, but our, our team is called the League of, League of Extraordinary Cloud DevOps Advocates. You might have seen that floating around on, in the internet. It's a joke, right? So don't get it bent. Some guy on Twitter got bent out of shape, and it was like a freaking joke, man. So he's, oh, okay, okay, you can, you can find this on my Twitter feed. The DevOps world has no place for elitism. That was the exact quote. Oh. Exactly. Like, dude, it's a joke, man. We were just joking. But we have actually cool, we have a cool dashboard. So I'm going to take you to our dashboard. <laughs> so here's our, here's our dashboard. So as you can see, the dashboards can get nuts, right? So this is a dashboard that has our mission statement on it. So our team understands that our mission is to this, to win the hearts and minds of all the cloud developers by using DevOps best practices. You can see exactly how many releases we do. You can see how our deployment is going. You can see what our availability is on our application insights, because we have application insights against our application. And instead of me having to go to the Azure portal to go see my Azure insights, I can actually bring it to my dev team directly inside of team services. So you can build really cool dashboards just picking and choosing. I can see how many bugs we have, how many work items, and I can see how many pull requests because I'm the final gate of all the pull requests that go into this application. And I can now quickly see if there's anything that I need to go in and, and have, a, have a look at. So yeah, it's pretty powerful dashboarding. And you can add additional dashboards. So you don't have to have one. We can actually have click on new and have a quality dashboard and a build dashboard with a lot more metrics and things like that. So And we also have a cool thing that we just added called wiki support. So I just did a show on 
Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm one of the guest hosts on that show. And I just did a whole show on this that'll be out on August 23rd. So on August 23rd on Channel 9, I'll show you where that is. I should have had this on my freaking notes too. So this is Channel 9. And that's the show right here, Visual Studio Toolbox. And on the 23rd, there's going to be one on the wiki support that we just did. And I also am a guest host on Azure Friday. And I just did something on Azure Container Instances and Kubernetes with ACI. So if you're interested in that, you'll be able to see that. But the quickest way to find my stuff is just to go to Niners and Donovan. And then you'll see all the entries that I have on, on here. If you're interested in just normal DevOpsy kind of stuff, I would highly recommend that you go and look at this DevOps interviews. So what happens is I find people inside of Microsoft that are helping deploy Visual Studio Team Services, and I ask them really, really hard questions on how do we use feature flags inside of Visual Studio Team Services? How do we deploy our databases inside of Visual Studio Team Services? That one is coming out next week. So this guy, this whole show is about consistency. We have 50 feature teams that work on Visual Studio Team Services, all merging into master every day. Right? This isn't long living branches that then have a merge bomb when they finally come together three or four sprints from now. These are 50 teams globally distributed checking into master every single day. How do you keep their UI consistent? How do you keep their architecture consistent? This is what we talk about for like 30 minutes, I guess, almost 30 minutes with this guy. If you're interested in other DevOps topics, there's a whole series here. So this is a, literally just general DevOps best practices that I share with a friend of mine. He well, now works for me, but he used to work at Octopus when we recorded this. And I hired him because of this interview, right? Because he we agreed on everything, right? So <laughs> gotta hire that guy. <laughs> and then um, if you like mobile development, this gentleman here is the guy who invented Hockey App, right? Hockey App is this really cool technology that allows you to deploy your beta and alphabets to your testers without ever having to go through the store. It also does crash analytics and a lot of cool stuff. So he and I talk about um, Hockey app and mobile. And if you want to know why it's called Hockey app, it's the first five minutes we discussed that because it has nothing to do with hockey. I hate to bust your bubble, but they don't even play hockey. But So he explains all that stuff. If you're a big QA or quality person, Gopi and I talk about testing for almost 45 minutes on how important it is and how to integrate it inside of your DevOps pipeline. Over here is Aaron's the only guest I've had twice. This was so popular because it's the first time we mentioned feature flags. And people go nuts over feature flags. They want to know how we use them internally. And then I brought him back because I had some follow-up questions on feature flags that I keep getting from the audience that I wanted him to actually go back in and answer for me, plus consistency. This is Sam Guckenheimer. He's a brilliant man that works at Microsoft. He is the, the, the visionary. Uh, and I, I, I validate everything that I say through him. And we talk about rugged DevOps and DevOps anti-patterns. Right? So things that you're probably doing in your organization that you should not be doing, we're basically going to be pointing fingers at you in that one. Right? So if you're doing some of the stuff we say, you probably want to stop doing that stuff in that talk. And then this one is all about infrastructure as code. Uh, I actually had a lot of fun with David Tessar. I'm a 20-year dev. He's a 20-year ops. And we came together to talk about how dev and ops are actually really supposed to work together uh, in that one. And then this one here are two. That's interesting. I hired half these people. He and I worked for me too. So if I interview you on the show, you might get a job at Microsoft. It seems the moral of the story. So this is about source control, right? How you manage your source control actually can really have a big impact on how well you're going to be when it comes to implementing DevOps efficiently. And these are the two, literally that guy in the middle wrote the book on TFS. And that's not a joke. If you go and find the 2013 book, it has his name on it, right? He literally wrote the book on it. And then this is probably one of the best branching guys I've ever met is Abel Wang. He just gets it, right? It's like a he just like Rain Man almost. He just gets how your branches should be set up. And we talk about how your branches should be set up to be effective. And that one over there, that's just the whole, sh the whole series started because we didn't have a place to park that stupid interview. Right? Some guy wanted to interview me. We didn't have a home for it. So I created one and I, I just start using it now. But that's just an introduction to me and the team. So this is a good resource. And it's also a podcast on iTunes. So you don't have to watch it. If you want to listen to it in your car, you can just go to iTunes and subscribe to the podcast. And they'll just come down to your phone as well. So, but there's a lot of good content on Channel 9. Just search for DevOps and you'll see a lot of good stuff up there. OK, so I think it's time to give away gifts, it looks like. Oh, you can go as long as you want. Oh, another question? Oh, great question. Sure. Let me show you that real quick. So we do, and it is the single, I think it's the most customizable Kanban board in the world. And, and, and that's not a bluff. It's, it's the truth. And I'll tell you why that is the case. Internally at Microsoft, we do things called bake-offs. A bake-off is where I, as Donovan Brown, do a presentation very similar to this one on a particular focus of Visual Studio Team Services. We have another employee internally go and learn everything they possibly can about our competitor's product and then pitch it against me. We did this about two years ago, and I got annihilated. It was embarrassing 
how much further ahead our competitors were than us. The beautiful thing about doing a bake-off is we're very prideful outside of Microsoft, and everyone left that meeting pissed off. Right? Every dev was like, how is this possible? This can't be so. We have to go fix this. And the emails that flew after that meeting were, how do we go and correct this problem? And what we got out of it was an amazing Kanban board. So for example, here is our board. And you can customize the lanes. You can customize your whip limits. You can customize the colors on these particular boards. I can come here and just add a new product backlog item. Let's just do, no, I don't want to do that in there. Let's do cancel this. And then you have now a new product backlog item, but I don't like that name, so I'm going to call this like create a release instead. And then from here, I can go ahead and even add additional tasks to it if I want to. So I can add a new task, and we'll do task two. And I can actually add tasks and even reprioritize those tasks right here on the board. Whenever I go ahead and drag and drop this, it actually automatically assigns it to me so that my team can go ahead and know that I'm working on it and get going. There's actually here we have so, uh, what's this called? Uh, Signal R configured such that I can have this up in Europe and someone else can have it up in America, drag it over and we'll all see it move automatically. So if you have a distributed team in their daily standup, you can actually use this Kanban board to collaborate. This Kanban board also integrates inside of Microsoft Teams. So if you've started using Teams versus Slack or some other type of communication, in your actual board, in your team room, you can actually see, and it should load here, you can actually see the board in your team room. So I actually use Teams internally as well, and I have one of our boards configured. A lot of this information also gets triggered, so all the pull requests go in there, all this kind of cool stuff goes in there. But this is hands down one of the best Kanban boards I've ever used. Right? So yes, we have Kanban boards, we have product backlogs, we have task lists, everything that you need to do your, your mobile development, I mean your planning, you can actually do inside of here. So if I were to go to one of my team rooms here, and this guy here, so we can actually integrate OneNote, we can integrate some other stuff. So here we go, the league, and then so this right here is going to basically be, oh, I, I signed out. Sorry. Let me sign back in here real quick. Do I have my phone on me? Oh, I don't have my phone on me. I am not going to be able to log back in, but I'm logged out. But if I could log back in, I think it's going to, it's going to ask me to do multi-factor off. It's not going to come back in. But you would see our entire Kanban board right here inside of, yeah, it's about to ask me for, I'm not going to do that. But you would see our Kanban board directly right here inside of our team room, which is really nice. And I can actually drag and drop it here, and you'll see the same changes over here in our Kanban board as well. Is that like a plugin for Teams or something like that? Yeah, what you're going to do is call the connector, and it should be already out of the box. So you just go and say, I want to wire up a connector. We have them for Twitter. We have them for Team Services. It's just in there. You choose what you want. You can have it show you all your work items inside of a conversation. You can have the <laughs> Kanban board configured. We have all of our pull requests come in there. Everything comes into our team channel. So it's just called a connector. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, from those two, um, there's a couple. There's a couple of vendors of ours that do that work for us. So I can take. I can show you those real quick. Tasktop is one, and Ops Hub is the other. So these two vendors, their whole business is doing what you just asked. We're using some other ALM tool and we'd like to get over to Team Services, they can either synchronize them for you or just do a migration and pull everything over for you as well. If you're on-prem TFS and you want to migrate to the cloud, we actually have a tool for that that will migrate that stuff for you automatically. Okay. Anyone else? If you think of something after, again, literally, I'm at Donovan Brown on Twitter. Just tweet me the question, and I've tweeted, I can't tell you how many times I've literally tweeted this answer to people who were like, Donovan, we want to migrate, and I'll just send them to these two. And I actually tag these two companies in there, and they usually get a hold of whoever I'm answering the question for. So if you want them to give you some attention, ask me again publicly, and I'll answer the exact same answer. And then they'll, they'll start to pay attention to you. Going once, going twice. All right, there you go. Up to you. Thank you. Yeah, once. Yeah, yesterday I did it. No, I wish. <laughs> it didn't mirror overnight. <laughs> okay, uh, the part that uh, um, says the show is over is when we do the crisis.